grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Since that very first miraculous and perfect moment when the Son of God was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and even before he was born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus, for all of his life, lived a lonely life. When Joseph and the rest of the people of the town of Nazareth found out that Mary had become pregnant, their first reaction was to outcast her, to divorce her, to shun her, to possibly even stone her and the baby inside of her to death. Even though Matthew tells us Joseph was a just man and wanted to divorce her quietly so as not to bring her shame, had it not been for God's angel that came to Joseph and reassured him that it was okay to take Mary as his wife, for the son actually did come from the Holy Spirit, then that's what Joseph inevitably would have done. But the will of God would not permit it. And instead, we see the conception of Christ fulfilling the prophecy that was told long ago in Isaiah 7. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Still, even before Christ was physically born, Jesus was displaced from his own hometown when the Roman government demanded a census, a, a registration that required his father Joseph to go to his hometown in Bethlehem, along with Mary and child. Of course, this also was to fulfill the prophecy from Micah chapter 5 that said, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. When Jesus finally arrived in Bethlehem, still in Mary's womb, he was yet turned away again as the innkeeper Turn them all away. Once Jesus was finally born, it wasn't that long after that he had to once again pick up and leave and become an outcast, fleeing to Egypt, as the angels instructed Joseph, because of the murderous rampage of King Herod. And yet, even that, again, was to fulfill the scripture given by the prophet Hosea that said it would be out of Egypt that God would call his son. Jesus' adult life and his ministry was no less lonely. Even beginning with his first miracle in Cana, John tells us in his gospel, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And throughout Jesus' ministry, we read time and time again how Jesus had to go off by himself alone to pray. And whether that was because of the crowds that didn't understand who he was and were trying to make him someone, a savior that he wasn't, or if it was because of his frustration with his own disciples, even his own family who thought they knew Jesus so well they didn't really need to believe in him, Jesus often found comfort only in his intimacy and in his oneness with God his Father. Jesus himself actually often described what it meant for him, him as the perfect sinless son of God, God from eternity in the flesh, to live amongst sinful people, to live amongst a sinful world. In perfect and righteous frustration, Jesus exclaimed in Matthew 17, verse 17, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? And in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus said, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And after being by rejected After being rejected by the people of his own hometown in Nazareth, Jesus also said in Mark 6, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. 
But none of this should really surprise us. All of this was only proving Jesus to be the very promised Messiah himself. The promised Messiah that the prophet Isaiah described and said would have no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Yet as you read the Gospels, you don't see this rejection of men ever deterring Jesus at all from remaining perfectly faithful to his Father. Jesus found all of the friendship, all of the love, all of the fulfillment that he needed in life in his relationship with God alone. Jesus was fully satisfied, both in body and in soul, by not only his relationship with God, but he was fully satisfied by carrying out the will of his Father, no matter what. As Jesus told his disciples in John 4, I have food to eat that you don't know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus lived satisfied by the bread of his fellowship with God. Just as he told and rebuked the devil in his temptation by the devil in the wilderness, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Throughout all of the loneliness in his life, Jesus seemed to be completely unfazed by the rejection of men. However, when we see Jesus just before his passion in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see something change. We see our Lord in deep agony, filled with anxiety. And as Jesus himself said to his own disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here with me and watch with me. What was it that troubled the soul of our Lord? What was it that had him filled with such agony that Luke tells us he began to sweat drops of blood. Well, it certainly wasn't the fear of men. (laughs) It certainly wasn't the fear of the might or the armies of men. Remember when Judas and his mob of soldiers finally came to arrest Jesus, that cohort of soldiers, hundreds with weapons and lanterns to come and arrest Jesus, all Jesus had to do was simply ask their question, Who is Jesus? He said, I am he. And they fell to their knees in fear. A power even his enemies could not avoid. And not even Pontius Pilate, with all of the might of Rome behind him, worried Jesus in the least. While on trial, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Scripture that says in Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And quite frankly, Pontius Pilate could not understand this. Why wouldn't this man Jesus, with such heavy accusations against him, speak up for himself? Pilate didn't understand that Jesus wasn't concerned with man's approval. He was only concerned with doing the will of his Father. He didn't understand that all Jesus desired was to glorify and be one with his Father. Pilate said to Jesus in chapter 19 of John, you won't speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you 
from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. So if clearly it was not the threat even of crucifixion that had Jesus in such agony as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, then what was it? Well, as Jesus so often did in his teaching, I'll let him answer that question with his own question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's nearly impossible to describe the physical pain and agony Christ went through in his passion. The pain he endured for the sake of pouring out his perfect blood for the sins of the world to be the sufficient offering that would satisfy the wrath of a holy God. The flogging that Jesus would have received left his body literally shredded, laid open, filleted. The beating that he received, the intensity with which the soldiers beat him can only be described through their own mockery as they took pleasure in it. A beating so barbaric that scripture says it left Christ unrecognizable as a man. Yet, throughout all of that, we don't hear one word of complaint from Jesus. We don't hear Christ cry out to God for mercy even once. We never hear him cry out against God, as you and I so often do, complaining about how unfair all of it is, asking why it has to happen. Jesus, as the perfect, silent Lamb of God, suffers physically, faithfully, and in silence. That silence, however, is eventually broken. And Christ's silence is broken only when he experiences a pain exponentially worse than any physical torment. His silence is broken with a cry that is piercing and deafening to anybody that has a conscience towards God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the only thing Christ feared in Gethsemane, separation from God, because that's hell. Hell is not fire. Hell is not brimstone. Hell is not gnashing of teeth. Hell is complete separation from God, being forsaken by God. All of the gnashing of teeth, all of the fire, all of the physical torment in hell is brought about by those in hell, those who have rejected God and have insisted that he leave them alone. Just look outside into this world and see what we already do to ourselves as a sinful, broken humanity, even while God's hand of providence is here and his presence is still here to be received. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Time and time again throughout Scripture, people ask Jesus the question, why? Both in our Wednesday sermons and in our Sunday sermons, we've been considering that question throughout this season of Lent, the why question, especially as we live in a time right now where many in our world may be looking to God for the very first time and asking why viruses and pandemics exist. Jesus' own disciples asked him in John 9 why that man had to be born blind. Mary and Martha asked Jesus, why did our brother Lazarus, your good friend, have to die? And as I've talked about a lot in the past weeks, and as Jesus taught himself, why isn't the right question to ask God? 
And why is why the wrong question to ask the Almighty? Well, my friends, to be as loving and as blunt as I can, why is the wrong question to ask God? Because He is God. And He owes us no explanation. We owe Him our absolute trust. We owe Him our absolute love and faithfulness in any circumstance. And we owe him that because of what he has done for us in his son, Jesus. So many times we ask God, why? And if I'm honest with you and if you're honest with me, I think we have to say the truth and that when we ask that question, there's an underlying implication that somehow God is at fault for the bad things, the suffering that's going on. That God is somehow at fault for why. In our sinfulness, when things are going well, when there is no pandemic, when the bank account has a comfortable amount of savings in it, when there are no storms disrupting our life as we think it should be, God so easily becomes second to everything else. But when things go wrong, when our world is turned upside down, our sinful tendency is to come to him and ask, why? As if he has to explain anything to us. Jesus suffered in ways that, thank God, you and I will never have to know. You and I and anyone else who puts their faith, hope, and trust in Christ. Our trust in God and not in anything else in this life, not in anyone else in this life, and certainly not in any one circumstance in this life. Because this life and this world will end. And when it does, we will stand before a righteous and holy God. Of all the questions that have ever been asked of God, of all the questions that could be asked of God. I've only heard one legitimate one. Out of all the why questions that could be asked, I have only heard one legitimate why question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, God, why have you forsaken him and not me? Even the criminal on the cross knew it shouldn't be that way. After one criminal crucified next to Jesus, joined with everyone else in mocking Christ, the other criminal turned to him and said, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what was the answer that Christ received from God? Silence. But because Jesus was and is the Messiah, the perfect Son of God, sacrificed for your sin and my sin, even then he remained perfectly faithful till his last breath. When Christ gave up his last breath and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. As we read in Mark, the veil of the temple was ripped in two. Because Christ was perfect, even through it all, the wall of hostility between God and man was brought to nothing. The earth shook. And it even caused the centurion who led Christ's crucifixion to say, truly, this was the Son of God. I don't dare try to put words into God's mouth. And of course, God didn't say anything in response to Christ's question of why. 
But if God were to have answered, I imagine it would have been something like, I have to forsake you, my son, so that I don't have to forsake them. Why was Christ forsaken? So that you and I can hear as the criminal did, today you will be with me in paradise. Why was Christ forsaken? The prophet Isaiah told us long ago, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has to put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Amen.